Welcome everybody. My name is Stephen Young. I'm an Associate Professor of Geography and International Studies at University of Wisconsin-Madison. I am also the Faculty Director of the Institute for Regional and International Studies National Resource Center or IRIS NRC as we're more commonly known. And uh, we're the people bringing this event to you today. Um, if you want to know a bit more about IRIS NRC, go to irisnrc.wisc.edu uh, and there you will find that we have um, a range of materials that are designed to engage and educate people about um, important issues in the world today, uh, lesson plans, international film clubs, international book clubs that uh, we offer um, for people on campus, but very much off campus and K-12 educators and post-secondary educators and the community at large. And we have a number of events forthcoming. So you can also sign up for the uh, mailing list if you're interested in that. We also have co-sponsors for today's event uh, that I want to acknowledge. The University Alliance is one of our co-sponsors as is American Indian Studies and also the Center for East Asian Studies. They're also fabulous people doing uh, great work on our campus. So do uh, um, look at their events as well and, and give them a follow on the socials. So Essie Lenchner, who works with us in Iris NRC, is running the tech today. If you have any concerns, if you're having any problems with your tech, please do uh, message Essie um, and send us something in the chat so she can try to fix that. Um, and also, as we get towards the second half of today's event, um, please do use the chat to um, pose any questions at the end uh, of the presentations, we'll have time for, for Q&A. So you can either post questions there and I will ask them uh, for our speakers, or you can raise a hand and, and ask yourself. Uh, before I introduce the event, um, I want to read the uh, UW-Madison Land Acknowledgement Statement. The University of Wisconsin-Madison occupies ancestral Ho-Chunk land, a place their nation has called De Job since time immemorial. In an 1832 treaty, the Ho-Chunk were forced to cede this territory. Decades of ethnic cleansing followed when both federal and state governments repeatedly, but unsuccessfully sought to forcibly remove the Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin. This history of colonization informs our shared future of collaboration and innovation. And today, UW-Madison respects the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk nation, along with 11 other First Nations in Wisconsin. And hold that in your mind because we'll be thinking uh, in today's event about what that might mean um, in material terms. So today's event is basic income. What can we learn from Australia and South Korea? The reason why this came about really was because as some of you might know, Madison has recently launched a guaranteed income um, pilot study uh, with the first payments going out this month. Uh, other parts of Wisconsin are, are launching similar kinds of experiments in Warsaw. There's conversations happening in Milwaukee about this as well. And it's really part of a nationwide uh, movement now, the key um, institution being the Mayors for a Guaranteed Income, uh, which is providing uh, resources and material support to, um, to fuel a number of different experiments in various cities. So while this is obviously a sort of nationwide movement it's also very much connected to a, a global resurgence and in interest in basic income guaranteed income universal basic income there's a whole array of different terms uh, there are important distinctions between them but there are also some very clear family resemblances between what these different policies look like as well and i wanted to use this event as a way to connect with people who are doing uh, research and, and involved with, with basic income movements uh, in other parts of the world to see what we might be able to draw from their experiences, to see where the conversation is at in different places and, and, and what some of our hopes and, uh, and also concerns might be about where this movement is going. So I'm delighted that we have two speakers joining us uh, today and they're going to give a presentation um, uh, first, uh, each of them for about 15 minutes, and then we'll, we'll be able to ask some questions. Our uh, first speaker is going to be uh, Elise Klein, who is an Associate Professor of Public Policy at the Crawford School uh, at Australian National University. Her research explores development, social policy, decoloniality, and care work. Uh, she's the author of two sole authored uh, research books, uh, Developing Minds, Psychology, Neoliberalism and Power, and Reading Amartya Sen's 
uh, inequality, uh, reading Amartya Sen, inequality re-examined, uh, and the co-author of uh, two, uh, co um, two edited collections, post-development in practice, alternative economies and ontologies, and implementing a basic income in Australia, pathways forward, which is obviously uh, one of the ways in which uh, Elise's work came onto my, my radar as well. And so Elise is joining us from Australia, where it's uh, 6.30 in the morning, I think, and we're delighted that she was able to make time for this. Our second speaker is Minso Cho, who is a PhD student in sociology here at UW-Madison. Um, He's originally from South Korea, and his broad interests concern the historical transformation of the welfare state in the Anthropocene, an era where the ecological limit um, of the regime of social security coupled with capitalist economic growth is growing increasingly uh, strained. Specifically, he's investigating knowledge politics of, over how to define, identify, and measure the efficacy of universal basic income in policy experiments and various uh, uh, laboratories that are uh, trying to introduce and, and, and refine this idea in South Korea. Um, and so I'm delighted that uh, Minso has also uh, been able to join us today. Um, we'll hear first from uh, Elise, so um, I'll hand over to you now and um, let you share your presentation with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks everyone for having me. I um, first want to acknowledge I'm calling in on the unceded lands of the Mirawong Gajarong people um, and acknowledge elders past, present and emerging and also want to acknowledge all First Nations people on the call today. Um, here in Australia, um, we are in talks um, for the first uh, for the first time. Um, uh, thinking about tra sorry, treaties have been talked about here for a very long time, but finally the settler state is starting to get serious. Um, and uh, just want to say that it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, I'm just going to share a little bit about the Australian situation about basic income. Um, first up to say that both major parties of um, the federal government in Australia, the current government, the Labor government and the uh, Liberal government, which was the former um, government of the last 10 years that lost um, just last year, uh, both do not support basic income and have um, expressed those uh, comments um, on many occasions. However, the third biggest party, the Australian Greens, do, does support basic income and has a policy um, around basic income. Nonetheless, I do want to talk about two um, two areas today that we, we've seen some, so I think, some promising um, possibilities going forward and and also to acknowledge the work of, um, there are local governments that are moving towards basic income here and then a lot of a, a big sort of general um, activist community here that is definitely pushing towards a basic income as well as the general population generally is quite amenable to a basic income. Um, that, that sort of population um, um, surveys around the support towards a basic income is rather fa favourable. So, um, you know, it's a, it's an interesting time um, here. But I will say just where we are at the moment, both major parties um, have and still do um, see, uh, say, see the uh, social security system um, as as a um, as something that people have to prove um, to to get support, um, and uh, and this has been a long history in in Australia, um, where uh, punitive conditionality uh, is is the norm. So what that means is that um, if you are uh, in the, in need of of some social security payments, which a lot of folks do because um, of the increasing casualization of the workforce in Australia. And of course, not everyone can work. Um, and uh, there's often also in parts of, particularly in remote parts of the country where I'm calling in from now, um, the labor market uh, is, is really limited um, and very racialized um, and, and which locks out a, a lot of First Nations people. So uh, the social security system at the moment uh, where we have payments well below the poverty line here. So um, around about $320 a week, Australian dollars if, for a single person, um, the poverty line is $609. So you can see a massive gap between what you're given and, uh, and, um, and, and what you need. 
And that's because living costs here are very, very expensive and they've, in, they've increased. But also on top of that, you're not just dealing with low social security payments, you're also dealing with um, punitive welfare conditionality. So we have conditions on what you have to do to get money, meaning um, you have to, uh, you know, do work for the doll and, and, and things like this. Um, but also we have a program of um, uh, conditionality on what happens when you get the money, which is um, conditions on, for some folks around, depending on where you live, um, you uh, you've got conditions on how you can spend your money um, and part of it's quarantined onto this card so you can only you can't get cash out and you know it sort of feeds into this whole thing of reducing alcohol consumption and and that even though folks on social security don't drink any more or use any more drugs than than um, um, the workers so you can see the kinds of stereotypes playing out um, in the social security system here I will say um, punitive uh, conditionality has uh, been long used on First Nations in, a, um, in, in Australia. In Australia. Um, it has been used as part of the assimilation processes that have been well underway since invasion, um, including, you know, stealing of wages and the whole sort of discourse around people can't um, People, people, uh, you know, can't look after their 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 uh, incomes, so the state stole those incomes. Um, and then, of course, rations were used, um, particularly where I'm calling in from, um, uh, up the top north of Australia. Um, the pastoral sector uh, used rations to. Um, take people off their land um, who were being hunted on their land, force them onto stations to work for free um, and used rations as a way of co coaxing people. Um, now we have um, specific remote programs for work for the doll that are targeted at First Nations people um, that has just actually um, been announced to be uh, uh, removed because um, it was found to be racially discriminatory. Um, then, like I said, compulsory income management, that quarantining of people's incomes onto cards has been targeted at First Nations people and the trials where it has been run out um, have been uh, at, uh, at where, pe where First Nations people, uh, a high proportion of First Nations people have been living. So um, that's the backdrop. So it's, it doesn't sound very good. Um, I, I, I definitely hear that, but I do want to talk a bit just briefly about two advancements that we've seen um, in Australia, which I think people thinking about basic income um, have uh, we can we can um, learn a lot from. Uh, but then also the last point I just wanted to reflect on is this question of um, um, universal payments in a in a settler colony such as Australia, but also um, America. Um, so I just want to say that um, at the start of COVID, something quite extraordinary happened. So I've just given you like the landscape of a very, very quick landscape of the Australian social security system currently. Everything changed really dramatically when COVID-19 um, hit in 2020. And the Conservative government um, did something that I don't think many of us saw coming. Um, and for a six month period, um, in, um, introduced a whole lot of measures that helped the social security system move towards a basic income. So what they did is they increased those very, very low payments to uh, to the poverty line. So people, um, you know, could, uh, you know, to, uh, were not just surviving. Um, uh, so they gave a $550 fortnight supplement. They also suspended uh, mutual obligations. So they took the conditionalities away, um, which was also a move towards a basic income. They changed eligibility criteria. So they made it much easier for people to get payments. Um, and they made the claims process much easier too. So we've sort of seen this as a, as a move towards basic income. It wasn't, they did not um, talk about this, we are introducing a basic income. They talked about it as emergency measures. Um, but because of these four things, um, you know, the broadening to, towards more universal payments, uh, more livable payments, um, um, the eligibility criteria, um, we we saw this as quite an extraordinary moment for Australia. So uh, myself and and colleagues uh, did some research. So we we started talking to people who received this payment to understand what it meant for people. Um, and so I'm just showing you some of the quotes from this study. 
Um, I mean, over, we've asked people about the positive impacts of these measures and also the negative impacts. Overwhelmingly, people talked about the positive impacts. So, you know, um, an increase in financial security, being able to make, meet basic needs. So being able to get medical issues sorted, um, to buy new clothes, not having to ration food, um, you know, to, to be able to get my son new clothes. Um, and, and people talked about being able to better support their children. Um, they were already doing an extraordinary job supporting their children um, on payments well below the poverty line. Um, but the extra income uh, made that incredibly important work um, a little bit a little bit easier, which you see in the bottom quote there. Um, and then um, the impact of suspending mutual obligations, so those punitive conditions that the state puts on people. Um, you know, people talked a lot about not having, um, you know, no anxiety, so an increase in psychological well-being, um, also uh, physical health. So um, one of the things that the mutual obligations, the work for the doll, um, you know, being forced to do um, make work activities, um, uh, I think, um, the late David Graeber called it, you know, had this term of bullshit, bullshit work. And I think, you know, a lot of people who are forced to do this work for the doll um, would would describe or do describe um, these these activities in a very similar fashion. Um, and time not being wasted um, is the other thing people talked about, that they had time to actually do things that mattered to them um, and including looking for work and, and being prepared to and, and preparing to engage back into the workforce. So being able to think about what study options they could take up or, and, and things like that. So removing the conditionalities was a huge um, support for people too. And, and you see um, when we ask people what did they use the time for because the state wasn't taking it for mutual obligations, you know, being able to look after kids, um, being able to do more study. And the final quote is people reporting about the kind of community work and ad advocacy work they were able to do with the time that they were, were given back. So I think, you know, whilst this, this moment um, was an extremely positive experience for those folks that were given the payments, um, we, when we asked them about what was negative, um, they said nothing, followed by the second response that people said was um, that it would be taken away. And I hate to say it, but the state did that. They reduced the 550 supplement um, by $300 um, and then they took it away altogether. Um, and that was extremely difficult. And, and I think that's an important thought, a reflection too, in terms of trials, what happens to after the trials finish, what happens to folks after the trials finish. Um, this was particularly cruel because it exposed how uh, cruel the state was um, in how, you know, poverty rates for folks who were receiving social security went from 67% down to 7% overnight because of these measures being implemented across the country. Um, and then they just took it away again and poverty rates, of course, have gone back up. People are going back to rationing um, and, and, you know, bare survival. Um, and so uh, you can see the kind of policy induced poverty at play here. Um, uh, and, and, and people, folks on payments being able to see that in real time in their own lives is really exposed to them how cool, um, you know, the, the structural disadvantage is and how and policies role, role in it. The second um, program that I just wanted to talk to you about briefly was um, because it sort of feeds into current debates um, in Australia at the moment is um, the Community Development Employment Program, which um, ran in Australia from 1977 to 2014. And it was a program um, as part of the sort of self-determination era. So like I said at the start, we've never had treaties for first with First Nations people in this country. Um, but there was a sort of move um, when folks were given citizenship rights um, in the 70s, uh, at the end of the, sorry, at the start of the 70s, um, there was a sort of... Uh, push where um, Aboriginal people were given, you know, social security payments, um, you know, there was a big push towards what was called self-determination. Um, it wasn't sovereignty, sovereignty, it wasn't like full sovereignty. Um, um, and of course, uh, in 2000, when we had the Conservative government, all of this was taken away in very dramatic terms. So um, it shows just, you know, how the way in which the state uh, um, uh, overreaches and colonization con continues. Um, but in this period, um, 
uh, one of the programs that was implemented in remote um, Australia was uh, this community development employment program. And this was a, an acknowledgement that, um, that remote labour markets are largely um, uh, are very limited, particularly for First Nations people, but also just generally, um, and they're highly manufactured. Um, and like I said at the start, were based on stolen wages of First Nations people. So, um, so this program, you had the state paying um, Indigenous organisations, um, all of everybody under their care, um, uh, their their social security payment plus administration costs, plus another sort of community grant to buy a whole lot of um, uh, uh, um, supports for activities. So, and those organisations would work out all the kinds of work that, that the community needed. So work was conceptualised in a much more broader sense than just um, paid work. So, you know, work on country, care of country, care of culture, language, art, all of this was all included as important work. And folks were paid that 15 hours a week. Um, uh, and um, and then they were able to get top up if there were was other jobs that came into the community that people could, could do. Um, this was an interesting sort of example as some in some areas we've we've seen that it was treated like a basic income because Aboriginal organizations just paid folks their money regardless. Um, and that and so everyone had a social floor to stand on um, and uh, an economic floor to stand on rather. Um, and uh, and then also we saw this broadening out of, of of work and sort of a real challenge to the settler conceptions of of work um, that sort of see it as as only paid paid employment. But you know since it was taken away and I and unfortunately this is another not good story of of the state um, taking away something that was working well. Um, uh, poverty rates have dramatically increased again um, in remote communities in in Australia. Um, and but but when this program was in play, this sort of um, you know it was a, it was was a work program, but but it did play it did function as a basic income, like I said, in the way that community organisations, Aboriginal controlled organisations implemented it, that people folks were just given the money, um, regardless of you know think because things come up, there's important cultural business, um, you know uh, um, you know ceremonies need to take place, and you know the the settler conceptions and of time and work don't don't fit with the needs of, of folks um, and so this was able to provide that that basic income underneath and from that you know huge amounts of work were, were able to be done or huge amounts of things were able to be done people did a whole lot of community development work social enterprise you know people paid for unpaid labor um all uh, um uh, unpaid care work sorry um so you know it was a it was an important um, program that, like I said, was taken away. Um, 2014 was the last lot of that. Then it was morphed into work for the doll, um, which was a very dramatic shift. Um, so now just to sort of finalise, just to sort of finish up, um, is just to say that program CDP has informed current models that are of a basic income and current proposals that are circulating in Australia, such as this one, the livable income guarantee. So instead of it just being for remote communities, um, it would be a, a kind of a, a participation income, if you like, that, that we see circulating um, for folks anywhere in the country that is doing um, um, any um, form of work. So this, this um, be interesting to hear what folks think. Um, Australia is really um, uh, plagued by the need to prove contribution, um, to prove um, productivity. Um, and so uh, this kind of um, proposal, I think, sort of speaks into that space and tries to broaden out this settler conception of work. Um, and, to see, and it's also a very gendered conception of work, that work is only paid employment and that, you know, unpaid care, care of country, care of culture, all of these forms of um, work are extremely important so it would it would try and challenge those settler norms around um, around work as just being in paid employment and this is the kind of program this is the kind of model that um, and proposal that the third biggest uh, party in Australia the Australian Greens um, has has taken up the last comment I just wanted to say was um, just this sort of tension that myself that that I've been sort of thinking about with colleagues here and and elsewhere around 
um, the problems of a universal basic income. And Stephen, you know, is it right to sort of say there's different models of a basic income and universal is just, you know, one part of one sort of possible model. Um, but these kinds of ideas of, you know, universal basic income and a rightful share for everybody. But in a settler co co um, colonial context, this question of what is rightful and what is a rightful share, I think is a really important one given um, the colonial uh, histories of dispossession um, that have gone on in our countries and that still continue to go on. And so, um, you know, uh, dispossession of land, of lives and of labour have been a major part of Australia, but then it still continues today through the social security system, but also through the policing system um, and, of course, the land tenure system um, and then, of course, the policy system. Um, and so this question of, of what is rightful, um, I think, is a really important one for us to reflect on here um, in Australia um, and and you know does a universal share really should it be a universal share or should some people get more because more has been taken um, and so you know I mean reparations have been a really important part of this conversation um, and and I and I think um, you know one one sort of model that I think um, you know is a very interesting and an important one is one that we saw um, from from the movement of black lives where they were talking about a universal basic income plus so everybody um, in America would get a universal um, basic income um, but uh, people of color would get extra as top up as to um, acknowledge what has been taken this was not the only part of their reparations platform and I think that's a really key one is that a basic income could net I don't think can can be enough um, to you know close gaps in statistics but but more than that ever repay for what has been taken um, but I think it's for in the Australian context um, it ha it is a, an important provocation um, for the work that still needs to be done here but also to acknowledge the role of the social security system in dispossession here um, so I, I see this this universal uh, plus um, model being a very useful um, uh, model here in, in the Australian context going forward too. I'll stop there. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Elise, um, for that, that presentation. That was really interesting. Lots to think through um, in, the, in the second half as well. Um, Minso, why don't we turn it over to you now and you can tell us a little about what's been happening in South Korea. Thank you. I will start now. So today I will talk about um, theory of basic income in South Korea, especially one actually existing basic income policy, which is called youth basic income that I will talk about shortly. After outlining a brief context of youth basic income in South Korea, I will talk about several lessons that you can draw from this case for those interested in promoting or critically reflecting on the politics of basic income all around the world. Mm -hmm. So let me start with the brief context of basic income politics in South Korea. So there are three basic income policy experiments or experimental policy in South Korea that is existing currently. First one being Gyeonggi Youth Basic Income. Um, Gyeonggi is a largest province in South Korea that is neighboring Seoul. And in this, in this province, if you are age 24, you can get almost $900 a year. Um, just for the sake of living in the city, living in the province, without any means testing and conditionality. So this is the one I will talk about today. There are also two other more basic income pilots or policy in South Korea, farmers basic income and rural basic income pilot. I will mainly talk about the first one, youth basic income today. Um, what started basic income policy or frenzy in South Korea is this organization called Basic Income Korea Network, starting from 2009 that was geared toward this idea of universal and unconditional periodic basic income for everyone. So rather than guaranteed income or negative income tax, universal basic income, UBI, was the idea that was most appealing to those activists in South Korea. It was initially led by socialists, but it gradually expanded to this alliance with other social democrats or social workers and more realistic politicians who tried to implement this idea for their own policy scheme. So 
Gyeonggi Youth Basic Income, GYBI, was preceded by Songnam Youth Dividend, um, which, is, which was also implemented by the same politician named Jae Myung Lee, who was first mayor of Songnam city, which is also neighboring city of Seoul and part of Gyeonggi province. And then after he became a governor for Gyeonggi province, he expanded this Songnam Youth Dividend into Gyeonggi Youth Basic Income. Um, with the same amount of cash payment, with the same eligibility, and same criteria for recipients, um, which took place in 2019. So how was this policy made? In 2014, Basic Income Korea Network was connected to Jae Myung Lee, the mayor of Songnam City, through one economist who was working in this city, who was also a member of BIKN, a Marxist economist, actually. Um, and the political background was there was an emerging social activism for universalist welfare states because South Korea already has a highly selectivist, selectivism, selectivist cash transfer program for the poor people. So the main axis of political antagonism in welfare policy was whether we have to have still highly selectivist welfare system or do we have to expand the cash provision or other welfare benefits for the whole population. And in this context, the mayor, Jae Myung Lee, who, wasn't, who was far from being socialist, tried to implement the idea of basic income in order to forward his own politics of universal welfare state agenda. Then why was it the youth? Why was youth selected as a policy category for the first recipient of basic income? That was the question. For policymakers, their, their salient motive was that because of this increasingly salient youth problem in South Korea after 1997 financial crisis, underemployment or unemployment of young population was becoming a concern for mainstream political parties, um, both conservative party and democratic party. So that was the motive for policymaker. But for activists, they had a different goal that is aside from solving youth problem, um, borrowing a famous phrase from the anthropologist Ferguson, um, James Ferguson, they tried to forward this idea of we can give a cash benefit for the working age population, which has been a moral taboo in social policy, even in the most progressive welfare state, even in like social and democratic welfare state. So they tried to forward this idea of transgressing this moral taboo. If they could give a money, a fish to working age youth, then they thought that they could expand the criteria or eligibility of this universal basic income for everybody. So that was their strategic starting point for forwarding their basic income policies. Of course, this idea was facing a fierce opposition coming from the ruling party, the conservative ruling party called Senri Party. Um, their main argument was that youth as a working age population who was epitome of vigor, energy, and potential and opportunity they don't deserve any direct cash handouts. There was a discourse of infantilizing those youth, um, casting a dub over um, maybe they could use this money for alcohol or other undeserving usage. So it was typical uh, sort of contempt or resentment for this undeserving poor or untrustworthy undeserving poor. The logic of defense coming from the mayor and activists was that it isn't a charity or gift, but it is a citizen entitlement. Um, and they were focusing on the dismal situation lying ahead of the young generation. So we can already see a dissonance between the intended motive of basic income activists and the actual real politic logic that they employed to defend this policy, because they were already mobilizing the specificity of the young population to justify the universe basic income as they originally framed it. Anyway, the policy was made despite this fierce opposition but it had a lot of consequences over the development of how to frame this money, not as a base, universal basic income, but as something other than universal basic income. There were tons of positive coverage around this money, the serious money called universal basic income uh, from both academia and from media or journalism in the public sphere, um, led by those economists and social welfare scholars employed by Gyeonggi province or democratic party they published a lot of results that is demonstrating how this money empowered this young population, this young people's life, more time for self-development, more time for reading books, more time for engaging with their um, friends, family. 
also less time for use in the unwanted part-time job because those 23, 24 year old youth in South Korea, they were supposed to prepare for their job seeking. They had to take some part-time job to make money for their everyday life. And this modicum of money, they said, was contributing to the decrease of time usage for this unwanted part-time job, which also resulted in improvement in mental health and nutrition, which is a positive outcome indeed. Um, on the other hand, journalism, also had a lot of storytelling going around um, this curious money, GYBI. Um, as you can see from this image on the right, um, this is the image that was first circulated by Gyeonggi province, but also it was increasingly popular among those journalists who tried to frame this um, GYBI as some kind of positive social provision for young people. So you can see these people's smiling faces and birthday cake. So it was framed as unfamiliar, unexpected yet, gladly taken birthday gift for this young population. Um, it's also a lot of storytelling was done this way that emphasizes more, it's, it brought more relaxed life for youth who now could move forward to the rosy future despite the dismal present that they were facing. The emblematic usage of the money they tried to emphasize was two things. First, toolkit for job seeking. So it was sort of a prepare, like prepare, preparation endowment for their future and fruit which is something that you could buy only if you have some extra money, right? So those were two emblematic uses that they tried to promote around this image of this money. However, according to my own research that I did with other cultural anthropologists in South Korea, uh, narratives coming from recipient side was quite different. Um, they of course certainly did feel the positive impacts made by GYBI, such as improvement in their time usage, nutrition and mental health and so on, because they were getting cash, right? Who will dislike any cash given to them, right? But when I was asking this question, what do you think is this money? How you frame this money to some other people who didn't get this money? And why do you think you're getting it? Their answers were strikingly different from that expected by UBI activists or politicians. Um, first, it was either charitable gift for the new poor or new precariats, if you will, or it was framed as necessary investment for prospective investee as a future worker, because young people, when they grow up, they will contribute to the society by engaging in economic activity. So it was quite different from the typical UBI recipients as envisaged by UBI academics and politicians. So there was a great decisive discursive drift from basic income discourse. The specificity of use was shaping the money of this particular basic income both for recipients and for journalists and politicians. So was it really a starting point as intended by the basic income Korea network members? It wasn't actually, and it had a lot of repercussions over other basic income schemes as illustrated by a recent development in South Korea this year. So this year we had a presidential election in March 20, 2022 as a momentum for um, basic income politics, at least that was what basic income activists were expecting. Um, so this mayor who made this youth dividend and developed that to Gyeonggi youth basic income, he became a presidential candidate from the Democratic Party, which was then ruling party actually. Um, it was a flagship manifesto. It was like number one, the most famous manifesto for this person, but to be only, only to be gradually marginalized as time, go, as time went by. Um, there were two changes in terms of basic income rhetoric that he employed. First, instead of emphasizing universal basic income, he presented an array of pedagogical basic income. Just like basic income for use, he came up with this idea of basic income for artists, basic income for people living in rural area, basic income for farmer. They were all justified with a potential hitherto unrecognized contributions that they can make. So it, even though it was framed as unconditional, it was implicit in, in that it was having, or it was expecting a certain kind of contributions to be made by those specific category of the population. And because of those category of basic income, the national or universal basic income for everybody, it wasn't framed as a main manifesto for the constituents. Not only that, um, a lot of people came up with this, a lot of people received this idea of national basic income as totally 
unfamiliar idea that was totally at odds with those kind of categorical basic income. Um, and after marginalization of basic income manifesto, nobody knows that whether his electoral defeat was due to marginalization or promotion of basic income idea. But anyway, he lost the election. And now BIKN, who, are, who was the very organization that started this use basic income from the first place, start, slowly started rethinking its pace of ways um, before. And it's, I'm, and it's kind of like envisaging a new plan for how to frame and forward basic income politics in South Korea. The lesson I want to draw from this small short tale of basic income in South Korea is that um, it pertains to this pitfall of experimental policy or policy experiment for basic income. Um, so Gyeonggi use basic income was indeed an experimental policy that was very unfamiliar in design, but it was framed as somewhat familiar sort of like policy that could be understood by those people. And we also know that, including the medicine forage fund that is taking place in this very city, there are like these arrays of basic income pilots or going ongoing all around the world in America. Um, be it experimental policy or a policy experiment, I think there is a common theme that we can draw from this short tale. That is, if we try to test or demonstrate the efficacy or performance or outcome of the basic income, basic income then I think it could shift our focus to the performance of the policies rather than whether why do we need it or how could it be justified in the first place. A Spanish basic income network chair, um, David Casasas, when he visited South Korea, he gave this famous saying that we didn't do any policy experiment with electoral democracy or neoliberalism. Then why do we have to run a policy experiment for basic income if it is just as important idea as democracy or social democracy. So following, echoing his claim, um, is that there is a dilemma between having a full universal basic income from the first place and starting from the categorical basic income pilots or experiments, as inevitable as it, as it is, the experiments, even the political feasibility and fiscal feasibility, better than implementing UBI in the first place, what I want to say was political pathways from the intended starting point to the end goal of implementing the full universal basic income wouldn't be so straightforward if, if it is necessary. So yeah, that is what I wanted to say. And before joining this event, um, I checked all those other kinds of basic income pilots um, run by mayors for guaranteed income in US. And some of them were actually indeed categorical basic income for say artists, unmarried mothers, and people just coming out of prison. So I think there are some resonance between this idea of running a category basic income experiments. And I just wanted to emphasize that there is a gap, um, if undesirable, between these specific spatial temporally bounded category basic income pilots and having a full universal basic income. Um, thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Lots more to be thinking about across these different uh, contexts here as well. So uh, we have some time now for questions um, and, and conversation with our speakers. If you have a question, please, could you either put it in the chat and I'll ask it, or even better, you can ask it yourself by raising your iconic hand or hand icon. While you're all thinking, shall I ask a question? Why not? Uh, my question is um, to, to, to both speakers uh, in, in thinking about South Korea, thinking about Australia is, is there, a, would you say, a kind of a movement, so to speak, uh, around basic income? I can remember you were talking, uh, Elise, about the sort of um, local governments being interested in the idea about act different activist communities being engaged with this and about a kind of broader public support. And likewise, it sounds like certain constituents in, in, in South Korea, particularly uh, in this region, Minso, were, were interested in. Has it 
are there signs that this can and, I, and of course one of the famous things about basic income is that it, it, it uh, generates interest across a, a, a wide swath of the political spectrum are, are there ways in which you can see that sort of coalescing into a kind of movement where people would um want to sort of come out and and march for this or demand for it or refuse to see this taken away um so thank you i i think yeah i mean the polling that's been done just um you know focus group polling across the country um uh, i think about there's about a 50 percent support for a basic income um and that's quite extraordinary given the kind of punitive policies that we've always seen we've, we've seen for a long time here um where people uh, you know the question when just the you know whatever the ordinary voter they sort of talk about being asked would you support a <clears throat> basic income um and also a, a payment above the poverty line without conditions of both the questions and there is a broad based support for it but what i was a bit concerned about is when the um government talked about take back in 2020 and they were saying we're going to take away that that um those covid measures were that were unconditional and that were a, a more generous payment or a better payment at least um people did it there was no outrage you know i mean a lot of us you know the advocates or um, activists definitely and, and folks that were on payments who were going to have them taken away of course all spoke out but the general you know population the settler population didn't really bat an eyelid and so that that was really troubling and I think we're still trying to get our heads around all of that um but but, but so I think there's sort of a a sort of a, a discrimination against those structurally marginalized and find themselves on social security um and then I also think people there's a part of people's brains here that think, well, you know, it could you know, casualization is real. I could lose my job at any time. So I kind of would like a basic income. So there's sort of a discrimination against folks that are structurally mar marginalized. And then also, but when they think about themselves, they might think about a basic income. So the, yeah, I, I, it will take a, um, a, a major party to really um campaign for it I don't think people will be out in the streets for it it's, you know a lot of set, like people here are a bit complacent quite frankly so yeah I don't, I don't think they're going to be out in the street for it but I I think it'll end up being something that will be necessary um uh, given the way in which the employment um situation is going here um my answer is pretty much in reference with a lot of that it's uh, mentioned so first, uh, those people who is far from the social protection that is um, aligned with like for this sort of organized capitalism um, that we had in like for this era in the country, they are like strong um, opponents of the idea of basic income. Whereas those people working in like platform sector or self-employed people, they are more of a proponent. And um, even though this person, Jae Myung Lee, the former mayor of the city who made basic income, got into these presidential candidates, there was a fierce opposition coming within the Democratic Party as well, especially from the people who was oriented toward this idea of having a, we have to have a first a robust social democratic welfare state first. And then that is, um, the basic income is to be sought only after we have accomplished a Nordic model or Finnish model of welfare state. So um, even though it is gaining ground um, among these, small number of people who is um, increasingly emerging as a like salient capitalist subject like platform worker and self-employed there is a little support coming from the major political party i guess say mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um thank you I've, I, i'm gonna um pose a couple of questions that are are, are in the chat um so that you can both uh, re respond to both of them um, one is about the idea of implementing a global UBI, and would that be more sort of sustainable in the long run? I know that there are some people who've thought about it in, in, in these terms as well. And I guess that that does get at the question of the kind of scale at which this kind of polish, we should be mobilizing around this policy as well. So any thoughts on, on that? You know, we, we see a lot of stuff happening in cities or in regions about, you know, moving beyond the nation, thinking about global UBI. Um, 
And a second question is about, in terms of your own research, what aspect of, of basic income are you most interested in, in exploring in your own research? What are the, maybe the, the question that you think is, uh, maybe needs still to be answered? And also, while you're thinking about that, and so there's a question about your reference to fruit as a, as a thing that uh, you could as almost a, a, a luxury that a UBI would uh, allow you and, and uh, maybe not something people think about in the, in the US context, but maybe you can tell us a bit about that. But Elisa, I'll let you uh, answer first if you would. Yeah, I think I think it's a great question, the one on the universal, um, uh, sorry, the global basic income. Um, and I think I think um, we must think about that and take and, and hold that as the ultimate goal um but with a few pieces to that because um because what you sort of see is the pragmatics being caught up in what that might so so that's why you see sort of smaller levels so you know often talked about at the nation state or at local levels and and basic income advocates i think are you know are, are very comfortable with that and seeing that you know we're just doing what we can and we'll sort of join up to this global basic income my issue with some of that stuff is there needs to, to me there needs to be a greater focus of the issues of unequal exchange and the kinds of ways in which since colonization and the global economy has been structured so that you know um what labor that i will do here in australia will pay be paid at a certain amount whereas if folks in mali were doing the same um labor they would be paid at a much lower rate. that right that is no mistake of design that has been you know set up um from um through sort of relations set up through colonization and um, um economic policy since such a structural adjustment and and various other trade policies etc cetera, etc cetera. So, um, you know, th that's kind of the politics or and but also very practical policies that don't I don't get enough attention, I think, with this push of um, of uh, global basic income. It's sort of seen as, yeah, it's a good goal and everyone will get a basic income. But but the sort of way in which coloniality still plays out and would still play out, um, I, I think we need to have much greater attention on um, to make sure that every, because, you know, the Australian economy, say, the American American economy, uh, they are not they are not disconnected from everyone else's economy. We are interlinked, and um, you know us doing well somewhere has an expense um, somewhere else. Um, and you know accumulation by dispossession is a global you know happens globally. Uh, and so um, you know I think I think those kinds of you know the underbelly of production um, is is something that that we need to continue to to focus on. Mm -hmm. uh, I will first talk about um, the question about fruit, and then I will talk about uh, the aspects of basic income that I was interested in. Um, so for the fruit, um, that's a good question. Thank you so much for that question, Etty. Um, so fruit isn't particularly expensive, as you mentioned. It is, however, sort of like a small lu luxury. So um, if those youths um, use their money for, say, buying an AirPod or iPad, right, it is a undeserving consumption for them because, so, like, um they didn't like the kind of like money themselves so they have to use it for um the real necessity that they are facing um but you know they couldn't just like eat just come noodle or like just street, street food right so fruit is something that is nutritious enough and a little bit small luxury sort of um that you uh, as understood by those policymakers and journalists that those um super poor youth wouldn't dare buy if they don't have any like you know pocket money but if they are given like small to sum of money um fruit is, fruit is something that could be a part of those um um positive tale or storytelling around the ubi because they are using for their sake but also it's not a that much luxury right it's just a small luxury that they, that they can enjoy so that's um why why they are so much into this idea of using money for fruit for the aspect of basic income that I was interested in, the idea that we have to guarantee an income floor below which nobody should fall. Um, I mean, the idea that doesn't apply into basic income only, right? It is also for guaranteed income or negative income tax. I think the compelling persuasive power of this idea is what brought me what brought my interest into basic income. Um, as it as compelling as it is, it's quite difficult to implement this idea, right? So I was always asking this question of like why people, even though they might agree that um, everybody deserves a human dignity and 
and having a human dignity and capitalism, capitalist society means that they have to have a certain amount of income, right? Why is it so difficult to implement it? That was the question I was struggling with for the past years. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Blake, um, I can see that you have your hand up and I'm so happy that you're here as the program manager for the Madison uh, pilot study. Please ask away. Hi, thanks so much for organizing this event. Thanks to the speakers. As um, Dr. Young said, I work with the, the Madison Forward Fund here um, with the city and um, this has been very very informative so thank you and one of my takeaways I, I was really struck by the similarities I'm hearing across here our experience here and then the two other examples that were presented today the sim similarities between sort of the narratives and stereotypes around um, basic hash assistance programs um, and one of our goals here is to be trying to collect as much data to really understand the impact of these programs. But we know that even if we do have supporting evidence or data, that's not usually enough to make change or to have a policy be put into place. Um, but a lot of it is around that narrative work and storytelling work that changing the narrative and those stereotypes. Um, so I'm curious if the speakers have any thoughts on what sort of work can really change the narrative, um, because I think that is so much of what is needed in addition to some of the data collection and research that's happening. My sense with the, thank you so much for the um, question and, and congratulations to you and your team for everything that you're doing. Um, my sense is that, yes, I think you're right. Um, and look, I'm a researcher. I believe in the importance of research, everything, everything. But I think these things, uh, basic income is very, very political and people will make stories up about your experiment, um, regardless of what the sort of um, you know, objective data says. And we've seen this again and again and again. And that's the nature of politics. And that's actually been used as an example of why, you know, why go for experiments? Why not just roll the whole thing out straight away is because the politicians are going to use it as a football regardless. Um, and so I just think being on the front foot and, um, you know, thinking about the sort of PR, thinking about the stories, thinking about how, you know, the kinds of discourse that need to be challenged through this pilot um, and and how the pilot is is doing that and, and these payments are doing that. I, I yeah, I have I hate to be very um, brash about that, but I, I, I really think that you've just got to be on the front foot because it will people will make up stories regardless of what the data says. Blake, thank you so much for your question. Um, also, I, I also want to celebrate the start of the Medicine Forward Fund in this city. Um, your question of what kind of work or evidence can really change the narrative, my answer is that actually we had plenty of narratives like from 30 years ago, like even in like 1970s, actually, this country had like some negative in income tax experiments as well, but those data were sort of forgotten and didn't wasn't discussed so much because the political terrain of the public sphere wasn't so much friendly to this idea of basic income. But I know that the tide is changing uh, very recently and it is changing, I think, in somewhat decisive manner. So if I were the sort of like program manager of the fund for a certain city, what I will do is collects very detailed life story of specific recipients that can um, compellingly present what kind of thing that we didn't know before or we didn't expect before, before giving cash to these people can happen in their life. It is something that we can only get, we can only know by doing a real experiment, right? So rather than, I mean, I, of course, as just, as, just like um, Elise mentioned, I believe the power of statistical data and number but my personal experience was that rather than just statistical data, what really moved people's um, opinion towards basic income to change was um, the very specific life story of those people, say how they were empowered and how their perception of this very money that is coming from some other source other than their family or their friends, how they appreciate and recognize this meaning of this money this kind of narrative really was appealing to a lot of public audience in Korea. So yeah, I wanted to mention that uh, narrative um, storytelling dimension.
Thank you so much for the questions. Thank you so much for your responses to our speakers. People, we're at time. We really are. I know that I would like to keep talking about this, but to be respectful of, of everybody's time, I'm gonna draw things to a close here. Uh, what I will say is that there is a recording of this event, that recording will go out and maybe we can also uh, encourage you to uh, visit the, the websites of our two speakers today um, and um, follow up and, and read some of the, the work that they're uh, uh, published and some of the research that they're working on right now to learn more about that. And uh, thank you so much for attending. So many, it uh, su seems like such a simple idea, just you know, giving cash to people, but who gets it? How much you get it? Why, how do you pay for it? Um, what are they supposed to do with it? All of these questions are why we need to have these kinds of um, uh, dialogues uh, uh, across the world really right now about this uh, important issue. So thank you, uh, Elise Klein. Thank you, Min Cho. Um, thanks to everyone for coming and uh, be well.